Hey community, welcome to Church Online. We're so glad you're joining us today. We just want to give a special shout out to all the moms that are watching, okay? Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. We love you. We're thankful for all you do with those that are in your lives. We look forward to, to joining in worship today. And as we do that, let's praise, let's give praise to our Waymaker. that sweet presence of God right now.
Everybody, welcome. I, I gotta say, uh, last week, Jeremy did a great job wrapping up our Anxious for Nothing series. And I really do hope that that series was so helpful and encouraging to you during this weird time. I, I will say this too, we are working on plans to reopen and as soon as those plans are kind of figured out, uh, we will make that public and get that thing started. But in the meantime, we're continuing to uh, learn from the Word of God together just like this right now. So thank you for joining us today. Um, I also got to say this. We had a couple more baptisms last weekend, and so I just wanted to say a huge congratulations to Daniel and to Corey. And if you follow me on uh, Facebook or Instagram uh, on our 60 Seconds with PJ, you got to see those baptisms. It was cool to be able to share it in that way, but really, really proud of both of them. And then also, I got to say this, next week we start a brand new series, working our way through the book of Ephesians. We're looking at what makes a church an awesome church. And I think what a great time to go back to the basics of, you know, what, what really is the church? Is it bricks and mortar? Is it buildings? Is it people? And if it's the people, then, and then how do we do this? And yeah, we want to gather together in those, you know, buildings because there's something really special about being together and being inspired and, and worshiping together. We can't wait for that to happen. But man, the church is so much more than that. And we've seen that in these last couple of months. So I'm grateful for that. But this week, this week is Mother's Day. And I just got to say how cool it is that we have a day set aside every year to celebrate moms. Now, it really got me thinking this week as I was making some chocolate chip cookies that my mom used to do that for me uh, throughout my life. But in, in particular, during my elementary years, um, we live right behind the, the school that I went to. I would just jump the fence, come home, and as fast as I could throw my books down, if I had any books with me that day, uh, I would run back out to play with my friends. So she made chocolate chip cookies to slow me down enough so I would sit down, have some cookies, have some milk, and talk to her. Yeah, my mom was a great mom. And uh, so on this day, as we remember our moms, uh, hopefully you have some good memories like that too. Uh, but I will say this. We are gonna dive into maybe one of the strangest Mother's Day messages of all time. I'm just gonna admit that up front. It's a little weird, but hey, we're in weird times. So if you have your Bible, I want you to find Matthew chapter one. And in Matthew chapter one, we're gonna see the genealogy of Jesus. Now, before we get there, I'm gonna to go to the smack dab in the middle of the, the, the 10 commandments. I mean, these are the top 10, right? And in Exodus, look at this, Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. So today we, we honor our moms and, and next month we're going to honor our dads. And by the way, every day we honor our grandkids. I just thought I'd throw that in there, right? So find Matthew chapter 1. And uh, at the beginning of Matthew chapter one, if you've ever read through the Bible or maybe you started in Matthew and you say, I'm going to read the New Testament and Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, I'm going to read about Jesus. You got into the first chapter and you're like, well, who are these people? I can't even pronounce their names. But here's the cool thing. There's 42 generations listed. We start way back with Abraham and we come to Jesus. And in these 42 generations, there are five ladies, there's five mothers who are listed. Now here's why it's the weirdest Mother's Day message ever. These are five crazy ladies. Now, no, they're not all completely crazy, but there are some crazy stories in the mix of this. And so that's what I want you to see. And we're gonna start up there in about verse three with a mom, a mother named Tamar. Here's the thing with Tamar. When I went back and I began to read in Genesis chapter 38, and I'm gonna let you read the story on your own, so you might want to make a note of Genesis 38. But when I went back to read that, I was like, how in the world do I tell this story in this setting? And I decided I'm not. Yeah, that's why I want you to read it. I mean, there's, there is a amazing dysfunction at a level maybe you have never even seen or heard of before. And that's one of the things I like about the Bible. The Bible just reveals the truth the way it is, dirt and all, problems and all. And smack dab in this list of, of the genealogy leading up to Jesus, the Messiah, Christ, is this mother listed named Tamar. The, the interesting thing about Tamar is that I would say, um, if you want to focus in on one quality as you read that story, you may be blown away as you read it. But as I looked at that story, I thought of so many people 
that I know in my life who've risen up out of dysfunction, who've, who've come out of some horrible situations, and yet God is still able to use them. In fact, look at it this way. At times, God's able to use us because of our past. You know, there's, there's history there and there's things that maybe we didn't like it. Maybe there were choices we made or choices someone else made, but God is still able to use us because of that past. Or sometimes he uses us you know, in spite of that past, right? And so whatever your story is, and no matter how dysfunctional part of that story is, God can still use you. And one of the things I admire about Tamar, and when you read the story, you'll get this, I don't necessarily agree with her methods, but man, she was persistent. In fact, I want you to notice this. She was persistent through severe dysfunction. Now, that may be your story. There may be family history. There may be you know, cycles of dysfunction and problems. And I just want to say, if, if that is your story, maybe Tamar can be an encouragement to you. And she persisted in the midst of that kind of an environment. And here she is now in the genealogy leading up to the Messiah, Jesus. It's a pretty awesome story. But I'm looking at Matthew 1 and I'm thinking of all these moms. I mean, there's 42 dads listed here. There's only five moms. Why, why was Tamar listed? Well, maybe just to remind us of this truth in Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Yeah, if for no other reason, Tamar remember, reminds us that God does not leave us, no matter how dysfunctional our family is, he is still with us. Then we keep reading through Matthew 1 and we come to another lady. Her name is Rahab. Now, Rahab is a pretty important figure in the history of Israel because as we read in Joshua chapter 2 and in Joshua again chapter 6, when you read her story, you find out that Rahab was this key person as Joshua sent spies into Jericho. The Israelite nation is about ready to cross into the promised land. They're gonna go across the Jordan River, which is a pretty amazing story by itself because it's at flood stage and God parts the waters just like he did with the Red Sea. But, but first, Joshua sends some spies into Jericho and they find a lady named Rahab. Now, the Bible is kind enough to give us her occupation. She's a prostitute. And this prostitute takes these spies, hides them, and then sneaks them back out of the city so they can get back out and tell Joshua. She says to them, I know who your God is. And in fact, when the Bible discusses Rahab in places in the New Testament, it always refers to her faith. And so I, I want you to see that as well as we kind of work through this. In fact, let's say it this way. She was faithful even with a checkered past. It may be that your past, like my past, has some problems in it, right? Some sins, some things that I'm ashamed of, so some regrets. And the reality is God still uses us and we can still be faithful to him even though our past wasn't that faithful. But like I said, uh, when the Bible refers to Rahab later, it always refers to her faith. James chapter 2, verse 25, look what it says. Even the same way, or in the same way, was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. Okay, so Rahab the prostitute, they said she was faithful, she was righteous. Look at this one in Hebrews chapter 11. By the way, Hebrews chapter 11, we call the great faith chapter. It lists out all the great people of faith. Rahab's in the list. Check this out. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. In fact, Rahab and her entire family was saved. But more than that, she winds up marrying an Israelite man, and then she becomes the mom, and you're going to see this, and it continues on through this genealogy leading up to Jesus, who is the Christ. Now, one of the things that I noticed when in the New Testament they refer to Rahab, they say the prostitute Rahab or Rahab the prostitute. I don't think they're uh, unable to let go of her past because that's not what God's about. I think it's just a reminder to us that God can use anybody. God can call anybody. No matter what your past is like, no matter how far gone you think you are, God is not done with you and he can still use you. That's why Romans chapter 10, verse 13 reminds all of us, no matter our past, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
And I'm going to tell you, that's amazing news. That's an amazing promise. It's repeated several times in the Bible. This is just one of the times that it says it. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Here at Community, you know, we, we've baptized uh, a lot of people over the years. And there's been a few times where in the back as we're preparing to go up for the, for the baptistry, you know, during the communion song or whenever it happened during our service, it's, it's happened a few times that some of the ladies who were baptized actually confessed in the back that they had been prostitutes. It was part of their drug life or part of their past. And one lady, in fact, uh, right before we baptized her, we always ask, you know, why are you getting baptized? And she says, because I know prostitution is not going to save me. I need Jesus. I mean, you could have heard a little bit of a pin drop in the room at that moment. And then the cheers broke out, right? Hey, your pastor, me, I've got sin too. I am just as much in desperate need of Jesus' sacrifice as Rahab was, or as, as maybe you are. We're all in this together. And that's why I go back to that verse over and over. Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Or By the way, right then, that was a great time for like an amen, right? And even if you're sitting in your pajamas, let's try it. Let's just see if we can get, you know, get a good one going here. Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord, Jesus will be saved. Amen, right? We keep reading in Matthew chapter one, we come to another mom. Her name is Ruth. Now, Ruth is a unique one in this list because while the other ones have some very sketchy kinds of backgrounds, Ruth has this, this shining character, this righteousness about her. In fact, she has an entire book in the Bible named after her. It's called, are you ready? Ruth, yeah. And so we find out about Ruth in that very book. But do you remember last week when... Jeremy was talking about the fears that we have. He mentioned this one. It's, it's actually hard to pronounce, but pentherophobia, pentherophobia. Anybody remember what that one meant? Here it is, fear of your mother-in-laws. <laughs> I love that one. That was funny. Now, I love my mother-in-law, and in fact, Ruth did not have this fear. She loved her mother-in-law, Naomi, and she took care of her. In fact, here, here's the story. I'm going to give you the quick version. Naomi actually, with her husband, left Israel to go to the land of Moab because of a famine. They're living there. Her sons get married. Ruth marries one of those sons. So Ruth and her mother-in-law, daughter-in-law. But then Naomi's husband dies, and then both of her sons die. And so not only is Naomi a widow, but so is Ruth. And Naomi's going to go back home, back, back to Israel. And she's on her way, and both daughter-in-laws are following, and she goes, no, ladies, just go back home. Go back to your own land. Go back to your own people. Find a husband. And Ruth says this in chapter 1. This is where the famous line comes from. Maybe you've heard this before, but Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. I love this. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Now, Ruth is an amazing story. In fact, you can read that little book. It doesn't take that long to read the story of Ruth. But here she is in the genealogy of Jesus. And what's amazing about Ruth is not only does she take care of her mother-in-law, but she finds a new husband in Israel, and his name is Boaz. And Boaz, by the way, has a child. Then who has a child? Here's another shout out today, a shout out to grandmas. <laughs> because Ruth winds up being the grandma to get this, King David. But here's what I want you to get from her story. She was loyal, even being an outsider. Remember, she wasn't from Israel. She was from Moab. Naomi told her, go on back to your people. And she goes, no, I want to be with your people and I want to serve your God and I'm going to be with you. She was loyal even being an outsider. She was a different race. She had a different background. She had, you know, there's a lot of differences here, but yet she was loyal to her mother-in-law and that quality really shows through. In fact, when I think in the New Testament of, of a verse that kind of characterizes what Ruth's life and heart really could have been like. It comes from this little verse in Romans 12, verse 12, when it says this, be joyful in hope, 
patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. You know, when I read Ruth's story, I, I see her just like that. Well, we come to another mom in the story. So I told you that Ruth's the, the grandma of King David. Well, King David is listed in here. And then the mother of Solomon, David's son Solomon, is also listed. In fact, when we go to it in the New International Version, it doesn't even give her name. It just says who was Uriah's wife, but her name was Bathsheba. Bathsheba is an interesting one because I'm not going to say that she did anything wrong. She was uh, beckoned by the king to come. You can read about it in 1 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. But in chapter 11, uh, while, while David's army is gone, he's you know, up walking around in this palace and he sees this beautiful lady bathing on top of her home. I know that sounds weird. They had a bath on top of their house, but he sees her. He's the king. He takes her. She winds up pregnant. And so David, in order to cover this up, has his, his commander-in-chief put Uriah, who is Bathsheba's husband, on the front lines and then removes everybody else so that Uriah is killed. By the way, you read about Uriah in the Bible. He was one of David's mighty men. He was one of David's great warriors. And yet David took his wife and then had him killed. So we, we find Bathsheba on the list. The mother of Solomon, maybe the wealthiest, maybe the most wise king of all time. We, we find her in this list. And yet, if you want to sum it up, you could say this. She was honored even though she was a victim. Now, I'm not going to say she, she was playing the victim. I'm saying she was the victim. Literally, she was beckoned by the king. She had to come to him. He sleeps with her. They get pregnant. David kills her husband. And then as a punishment to David, God kills that little baby, the baby born out of that sin. Later, they have another child. His name is Solomon, and we continue the genealogy. But again, this is what I love about the Bible. Uh, the Bible, and some people believe this is part of the, the validity or, or the proof of, of the the historical accuracy and the truth of the Bible. It, the Bible shows us warts and all, even God's heroes. King David, who the Bible says is a man after God's own heart. King David, one, one of the greatest kings of all time. King David, who everybody talks about as the main king, who was the spiritual leader of that nation, also was a horrible sinner, just like we are. But God shows us all of it in the word of God. And here's Bathsheba stuck in the middle of this. Now, when David comes back to God and he returns and he repents of his sin, we can read his prayer in Psalm 51. Now, this is David's prayer, but check this out in the middle of this prayer. This is verse 12, and it says this, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. I read that again this week, and I thought, you know what? I think Bathsheba probably prayed that prayer too. I'm just guessing. But can you imagine how much she needed God's joy again after having her husband taken away and killed, after having that first child who died after, after that child was born? Can you imagine the grief she felt? Wouldn't it be true of her to be able to say too, restore to me the joy of your salvation? And it may be that you suffer because of the sins of someone else. It may be that the consequences you're living through are are the result of someone else's horrible choices. And maybe you got caught up in it. Maybe it was your fault too. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe you're a willing participant. Maybe you weren't. But the very real consequences in your life are a result of sin, whether they're yours or somebody else's. And so I think for Bathsheba, for David, for you and for me, we can look to Isaiah and see the hope that comes out of this verse in chapter one. Look at this. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Yeah, that's a great promise for all of us. And then we come to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. And this is not up here on the screen, but let me just read for you verse 18 because we come to Mary. It says this, This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Yeah, Mary. We know about Mary. I mean, 
Mary, the, the special chosen one of God to be the mother of Jesus. What an amazing invitation that was, right? What, a, what an amazing announcement from the angel. By the way, Mary, you're going to have a baby. And she says, how can this be? I've never slept with a man. And the angel explains it. Now, I want you to see something I think is pretty important because we've talked about other moms who were persistent and faithful and loyal and, and honored even in the midst of the situations they were in. But Mary, I would say it this way. She was specifically chosen to be the mother of Jesus even though she was a virgin. So, so think about this. <laughs> She's chosen to be a mom even though she was still a virgin. And, and really what we could say is she was chosen maybe because of her purity, because of her holiness. But there's another reason she was chosen. Check this out. Mary was specifically chosen to be the mother of Jesus, even though she was young. Think, think about this one. In Jewish tradition, when you were betrothed to be married, like it says that, that Mary was, you were probably somewhere between the age of 12 and 14. Right? So you're promised to be married to this man. You're between 12 and 14. It was during this time, most likely, that Mary was was visited by the Holy Spirit, and she became pregnant. Most people do believe she was probably 14, 15 years old, which is pretty young, right? But she wasn't too young. Listen to this. She wasn't too young for God to choose her. It's not because of our age. We can be young, and we can be old, and God can still use us. That's a pretty important reminder for all of us right now. You are not too young to be used by God. You're not too old to be used by God. And there's great stories of both extremes in the Bible, right? And everybody in the middle. God can still use us as long as we, like Mary, respond the same way. And when she heard the news and had it explained by the angel, this is what she says in Luke chapter 1, verse 38. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Here's what she's saying. God, if this is what you want for my life, I'm in. <laughs> I'm all in. May it be fulfilled in my life. May your, may your choice, may your will be done in my life. I think that's the prayer all of us need to get to. God, just like Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. And to wrap this up, I just want to say, whether you're a mom, you're a dad, you're a boy, you're a girl, whatever your situation, these three truths are real. And here's the cool thing. The five moms in this list remind us of these truths. And here they are. Number one, God can use anyone, right? Hey, look at Tamar. Look at Rahab. Look, look at their life. Look at their background. Look where they came from. God is still able to use them. Number two, God invites everyone. And that's why we said, everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved, right? That's an incredible promise, an incredible promise of hope for every single one of us. So you can't say, yeah, but you don't know what I've done. Nope, God does. And this is still true. Everyone, everyone, everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. But here's how it gets really personal. Check this out. God chooses you. God chooses you. We actually read about this in Ephesians 1 where he says, God chose us before the foundations of the... Well, anyway, we're going to get to that next week when we start the book of Ephesians. Let's do it this way this week. John 3.16, maybe the most famous verse in the Bible, reminds us how personal this really is. He says, for God so loved the world. Now, that's covering all the people, but you can just put your name in there. That's how personal this really is. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. You know what? God does choose you and he chooses me to have this relationship with him and he makes it possible because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. All the, that sin, the baggage, the mistakes that we mentioned, he takes care of that. We don't work our way into this. He does that. He does the hard, heavy lifting and we just get to say, yes, thank you. And then we live out our life as worship, you know, expressing that he is now king and Lord and boss, and we are forever grateful. So let's pray. Father, on this Mother's Day, we thank you for these ladies listed in Matthew chapter one. We thank you even for the, the bizarre stories that are in there because they just remind us of these powerful truths. You can, you can use anybody and you do invite everybody. 
And in fact, you have chosen us. So thank you for inviting us to be a part of your family. God, I pray that you would continue to use community to help connect more and more and more people to your family. Not only now during this pandemic time, but in the weeks and the months ahead as we kind of move on from that and we get back to life as maybe more normal than we've had these last couple of months. But God, would you be honored in us? We, maybe we too, like, like Mary could say, God, whatever you want, that's what I want for my life. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Love you. See you next week. Wow. That was interesting, right? All those moms in the genealogy, they fit together in a unique way. But, but what's neat is God uses people. Through all of the good, through all of the bad, God chooses to use those people. And he chooses to use me and he chooses to use you. Man, that's great news that we can hold on to. We're so thankful that we are in this together, right? Well, as we kind of close down today, we just want to say thank you for being here again. And thank you for giving. You guys have been so good throughout this pandemic to, to continue to give and bless those that are in need. And we're thankful for that. As we enter into a time of communion, we just want to spend time remembering the sacrifice that God did for us, sending Jesus to the cross. And we do that with communion. And so if you haven't gotten your bread or, or your juice, maybe you can hit pause and do that right now. Otherwise, right now we're going to take communion together. Because Jesus gave his body. He, he spilled his blood for us. And so right now, as we remember Jesus' broken body, the body that, that loved us so much, we take that together in remembrance of him. And Jesus hung on a cross and his blood spilled for us. The, the love that he had for each of us. And we, we drink that in remembrance of him. I'm so thankful that God loves us so much. Are you thankful too? Hey, we hope that you have a great week. We hope that you're celebrated if you're a mom. And we'll see you right back here next week.